quality of it decide the entire performance of the fuel cell stack. And uh, in a simple conclusion, that's what we end up with, seven layers and the A. So in the middle membrane, next to it are the catalyst layer, next to the catalyst layer is a microporous layer, MPL, and then finally, they send it to the five gas diffusing layer. So the gas diffusing layer not only diffuse the gas, they move the water, conduct the electrons, as well as the supply the strings. Right? So otherwise, when you think about membrane, it's a pretty it's ultra thin right? unit. Um, production wise, we can't jump in very quickly because the different manufacturers have a slightly different ideas. But generally speaking, uh, that is the way you can produce and rolls, because the membrane can be supplied in rolls, and uh, you print the catalyst on both sides and on the cathode side, and then further sandwich with uh, the others. And uh, for the machining side, uh, that's, uh, uh, basically there are few basic technologies you can do that. Then we can again, it's down to the manufacturers, so different manufacturers have slightly different strategies. But generally speaking, um, once you put uh, the catalyst out, you get quickly the microtorsis. So that one, we can list it for your reference as well. So next key components but for the fuel cell, and we mentioned MEA, now let's talk about another key technology, is a bipolar plate. So what is the bipolar plate? We you think about it, overall, we need to supply air into the MEA. We also need to supply the hydrogen into the MEA, then let the MEA do the job. How can you supply the gas into the MEA? First, we need a channel. So we need to get uh, design the channels to let uh, the gas be channeled into the system. And the second, well, we need uh, external electric connection. Uh, so when the pro uh, electrons being collected, and then that's to be conducted, guided to the external circuit to give you the electric power. So therefore, for the bipolar plate, fundamentally for that plate, you need to do at least one, two jobs. So one job is gas, the guide the gas into the MEA, but second is take the electrons out to form the external electric current. And in addition to that, there are other issues here. But the other issues, such as uh, a heat removal, so the whole system is not 100% efficient. The inefficiencies will be converted into thermal heat energy, and you cannot let the heat accumulate. If you let it accumulate itself, the temperature will go up. As we said, this kind of technology can feature a uh, temperature operation if the fuel 100 degrees plus, and you have to move excessive amount of the heat energy. Have to have a cooling circuit, and where is a cooling circuit, and it's had, it cannot be built inside the MEA. So somehow you have to do the bipolar plate. That's another function of it. But overall, it's need a stress. Uh, the system, I mean, the MEA itself, a GDL, that's not a stress, and uh, the, the membrane in the middle is ultra thin I mean, material, so it doesn't give you this method. But pulls them into a unit, and uh, the, the mechanical strengths of all the unit don't come from bipolar place. So therefore, when you think about uh, bipolar place, that's provide uh, uh, quite a few requirements. It's got to be electrically conductive, and it's got to have the flow field, and uh, it's a provide uh, the strengths that you can integrate the system together, and they have the so that is uh, the bipolar place we just mentioned. And for the gas channel, that is roughly the gas channel. If you look at it this way, so very much is that is the MEA in the middle. So you have to design a channel to let the hydrogen flow into it, the opposite, you have to get the oxygen flow into it. And also, you have to connect with the middle MEA. The connection is coming from here. So you end up with a bipolar plate connection, channel, connection. Opposite is the same. There's a connection, channel, and uh, uh, and connection. So in the end, we can always machine the channels out or of uh, be uh, a plate, a conductive plate. So roughly, the area of channel 
and a connection is roughly, in most cases, so roughly 50% of the whole connection connect with the MEA for electron conductivity and the 50% the opening up as a channel for like the gas. So it has to fulfill the two purposes. And the channel design, there's a lot of a different channel design. And uh, many manufacturers, many manufacturers have uh, many different ideas. And, uh, but generally speaking, it defines a fluid friction, uh, maximizing the water removal and optimizing the gas distribution. So that's the few basic requirements of the gas channel design. Um, generally speaking, uh, it's following roughly three basic principles. One principle is a single serpentine type of the gas channel. You've got a gas in, serpentine, and a gas out, a single channel. For this kind of channel, you end up with an ultra long channel. From the in to out, the channel is very long. The long channel means the fluid restriction can be very hard. So that is the one. And uh, then another one is a straight in parallel. Simply, that is a in, that is out. And it's a cross, there's a main in gallery, there's a main out gallery, and a cross in the middle are the gas the channels. Obviously, the full restriction is small in this case of design. But all the multiple serpentine. So that's a single serpentine, that is the multi channel structure. And that, that's roughly in this kind of design. I mean, furthermore, there are different, later on, we will see some manufacturers there, for, uh, there are different designs. And uh, so connection, and uh, that is, uh, if you think that is the bipolar plate, and uh, right in the middle are the gas channels. For the gas channel, that purpose is gas for gassing and diffusing into the um, gas diffusing into the MEA. And uh, then in reality operation, and especially on the castle side, it's from the water, and the water is in so it's a bi-directional reaction. But, and the bipolar plates, so there are different, there are other normal flow field designs. For example, you can get a different. It's not, I mean, serpentine, multi-serpentine is not really the, the only design. So the people have a slightly with different ideas. And uh, if you're interested in that, especially if you are expert in dynamics, um, and that is a pretty good area to do a lot of analysis to find the optimized design condition fulfill the previous questions, right? And uh, so overall, it's a problem of transportation. And so we can jump to so there are too many of them. And uh, so fulfilled, that's one thing also worth to mention about uh, potential um, blue field materials is this kind of porous material. It's very much like a sponge. So that's got all the pores, and then there's the structure. There are quite uh, a lot of uh, porous materials available. The beauty of this kind of material is it will very nicely distribute the gas. It's fundamentally, it's a larger pore of uh, GDL gas distributed layer. It will, it's much better than the channel. Uh, disadvantage at the moment, most of materials being used for the uh, metal, pore, metal form. Uh, turn to be, I mean, very weak in sort of response to the corrosive environment. But, and the bipolar plate design, there are, well, I mean, uh, other designs, that is normally the conventional designs you can see. Um, so you've got the MEA right in the middle, but, and uh, then you've got the channels. So, for example, here, as the channels, the channels are gassed through. And also on the opposite, you got the channel soon. That's the end up with the material to build up the bipolar plates from the very thin, like metallic material. Then on one side, there's a channel, you find it on this side of the channel, on that side of the channel, and separated by the metallic wall. So that is in a way you can call it a two dimensional. And uh, there are further clever parts, um, the three dimensional mesh. Design. What they did is uh, basically they still have the channel internally, but the channel is also open. So that's the channel, one channel, one channel. But they open to the external side. They build a, 
a certain layer down there. And for that certain layer to its purpose, we're not going to talk about too much details. I think it's going to be static by manufacturer by NKR. For the purpose is to try to make sure the water removal. So especially on the castle side, we're constantly from the water and the efficient water. So that's what they designed. So basically, conclusion quite simple. For the channel design is uh, uh, many, many different ideas. Uh, which from a different manufacturers depend on the experience and analysis. So that's uh, they may can come up with a very different idea. So we jumping fairly quickly about the bipolar place. And the reason is the bipolar place is a supporting unit. Although it's equally important, but it's supporting really the MEA's reaction. And the MEA is the, the really the fundamental stuff. So we really need to understand the fundamental MEA for the bipolar place that is really They give us a good enough channel and good enough strength to support really the gas diffusing, water removal, and the heat control, uh, thermal control. So the next thing is assembly. That becomes uh, quite uh, important and quite interesting issue. Um, a big advantage for the fuel cell. So you can always produce a single cell, which is an anode the cathode with an assembly is a single cell. And that single cell electrochemically if you end up one side is the hydrogen, another side is the oxygen, the voltage, the electrochemical voltage is fairly low. Open circuit is about 1.2 volts. But in reality, once you start for the current, you build up the resistance voltage decrease. And let's say a single cell gives you about 0.6 volts. And 0.6 volts is not good to value your car. But what you need is possible is 400 volts. And what's the way to get 400 volts? Just stack the field cell together. Right? And if you leak them, you see end up with a voltage. So that's give you the high voltage. So in the end, for fuel cell, is always need to post them together to build up uh, assembly, fuel, I mean, a fuel cell stack. So before we talk about fuel cell stack, we need to see what is the single cell stack, the single, the single cell assembly. The single cell assembly, the very important one is the membrane. The membrane is right in the middle. You got that membrane. And next to the membrane, and we got this, uh, we got uh, this, uh, this one, the C. And uh, where is it? Right. Uh, so the membrane is the F. The F is gas diffusion layer. So you put the gas diffusion layer, then you form the central MEAs. And the MEA to put into the system, you need uh, a saline gasket because one side is hydrogen, one side is oxygen. We distribute the hydrogen in, is uh, let the hydrogen into the gas, into the MEA, not into the oxide. So you have to do the, the gasket to do the saline job. And once we got uh, the saline, then we got uh, the gas distribution plate, which is the bipolar plate. B um, BPP. And once you go to the bipolar plate, then we have to have an external electrode. So then you can link the tube to get the current. You can call that one as a current collector. So that is a current collector as the B. So current collector on two end. After that, you need a mechanical unit to hold it together for the laboratory test as the one list. That is the end plate. So that is the A. So we got end plate, the current collector, and uh, bipolar plate, and right in the middle is the MEA. Between the MEA and the bipolar plate, you have to put a gasket to seal it out. An entire unit, you can assemble it like this. So you got uh, the end plate, the two aluminum block in this case, and uh, the, the copper plate. Give you one electrode connector, another electrode connector, that's current collector, and right inside the very thick um, a carbon plate, that is uh, basically that's the uh, bipolar plate. Right between the two bipolar plates, uh, the black thin line here, uh, very, very thin, that is the MEA. Right? So that is uh, the whole unit. And 
for the activation uh, active area in the laboratory research site, we turn to flavors such as batteries of small cell. It's only five stress. Right? And for that, it's a big control, easy to manage the, all the thermal environment, etc. But it's, it's not very useful to put in the car and it doesn't give you anything. Uh, so the starting research point and the rest is once you come from the idea you start to march the surface area. Uh, for automotive it has to be put under the class. Uh, that's because of the current, overall current of heat. Well, so that is uh, the signal cell. And uh, operation, how do we do the test? Well, and the operation you need to control the two things. One is the hydrogen, and of course you need to control another one is oxygen. And uh, during the operation, we need to closely control the temperature. Also, I mean, to make sure the temperature is uh, in optimal region, definitely not an exceeding I mean, I mean, thing that's a little bit of overheat, and it's uh, below 100 degrees the operation. And of course, we need gas pressure, hydrogen pressure, air pressure. Then the next thing, the whole thing needs to be connected to an electric fan load. Uh, basically, the uh, low bank to take the power out and convert the power to something else and fix the release it. And then you can test and evaluate uh, the fuel cell performance. Uh, so, uh, select an engine. When you test the engine, you have to put the engine on the thermometer. The thermometer is taking the power engine generated and converted into the let's say, heat, and then you have to put the water to cool it down. For the uh, fuel cell test, you do almost exactly the same thing. You operate the fuel cell, you have to put uh, an electric load bank to take the power generated by the fuel cell and convert into something such as the heat and then cool down the fuel bank. Right, so that is the unit. And uh, during the operation, the thing we need to really first um, we need to work out is the reactant flow. And in the reactant flow, the calculation is fairly straightforward. So the reaction N often is equal to the, the current divided for the four divided by the Faraday constant. But for the hydrogen, again, it's the current divided by two and divided by the Faraday constant. Uh, the, the, the two, when they ask the two came from the two is of each hydrogen atom into a single electron and uh, each hydrogen atom uh, um, molecule contains two atoms you know, two electrons so that's why that is a molecule of uh, the hydrogen so that will give us electrons divided by two so you then you can work out what is uh, the oxygen and uh, divided by 21 percent of the air flow rate and on the other side you can work out what is the hydrogen flow rate according to how much current you are drawing from this particular cell. So you can take it out on that one. So fairly, fairly straightforward. It's a kind of a uh, little bit easier than the, I mean, the, the engine side. Then on during the operation, it's exactly like the engine. Right? You put, uh, the, let's say, 10 molecules of the fuel in it. You're not really expecting all time well to join the reaction to produce the heat. Possibly your reaction efficiency is 90%, but nine molecules will be joined the uh, the, the many one will be pumping out at the hydrocarbon emissions. But exactly the same down here. You put the three molecules of uh, hydrogen into the system, you're not expecting the time will be all reacted. So possibly not 90% reaction efficiency, another one will simply pass through the system. So what you really need is you need to supply a little bit more than you need to give you the current you want. Right? And how to define that? In fuel cell industry, they turn to call it the stoichiometry. Right? There's a, a cathode stoichiometry and anode stoichiometry. Definition is quite simple. The actual amount of flow rate, the actual flow rate of the reacting gas divided by the reacting part of that gas. So basically, the reacting part, the reaction part, is the current. You divide the current you need so much. That's so much reacting to produce that current. You reacting you need to supply a little bit of extra uh, for the efficiencies. So overall, a good stoichiometry 
normally we see on the anal side, it is a hydrogen. You rather not waste the hydrogen. So theoretically, you will lack a cell geometry equal to one. So I supply one molecule of hydrogen, then one molecule of hydrogen needs to be acted rather than waste it. So in reality, but in most cases, it's not so efficient. And so you may supply a little bit extra, not significant extra, but 10, 20 percent extra. But on the cathode side, since there are flat since that is the air, but it is you take air from the environment, pass through the system, it is inefficient, it is always rejected back into the atmosphere. So it is a kind of a break, but so therefore you can afford to use a little bit more to improve the reaction efficiency to compensate the inefficiency of the gas and the pumpkin airflow around. So you can go as high as a three. So that's mean the 300 times. 300% uh, of your requirement, the actual requirement. So that's a stoichiometry. That's the two parameters of what you tell guys that always need to understand and always need to We have just the stoichiometry um, to ensure I mean, we can deliver the current of the, of the need. So performance. And uh, I think this one. So it'll be a little bit later if I dump him a little bit quicker and uh, there will at uh, least one. If I can dump him over here, let's uh, make uh, a little bit of explanation before we see the other uh, operating parameters effect. So for any fuel cell, hydrogen fuel cells, we draw the current and uh, well we define the current, uh, draw the current and we end up with a voltage. Right? And we end up with a typical this one called polarization curve. Right? For this polarization curve, there's a few lines down here. The very first is on the top. The top is uh, a theoretical electric, uh, electrochemical potential between oxygen and hydrogen. So if you've got a catalyst, so that hydrogen converts into proton, you've got oxygen to react with uh, the proton, what is the water, you naturally, without any losses, you end up with uh, that uh, theoretical uh, voltage. And that voltage is about 1.4 volts. It's a slightly a function of temperature, but in the sort of temperature they are operating, it's 1.4 volts. But in reality, once you supply the hydrogen in the system, the hydrogen needs to contact with the catalyst and generate what we call so called triple reaction, and uh, then that is talking about the activity, the catalytic activity. And once you put that one in, the voltage is no longer 1.4, there's a lot based on it. That loss makes the 1.2 into kind of a 1, 1 volt. And that 1 volt, what we call is an open circuit voltage. Right? And it's already started, I mean, the action, chemical action, and the book will not really deliver the proton yet. Uh, there's no transportation losses yet. Uh, so you end up with a, a, a practical voltage. There's no current. At that moment, it's one volt the highest. And the thing is, once you start to draw the voltage, or once you start to draw the current, at the right beginning, then the, the, the protons need to be generated and I mean, dissolved into the mantle and pass over to the other side. The electrons need to be taken. So you start all this kind of transport, uh, the activation, uh, and activate. For that activation you're talking about, there is a loss. So the voltage starts to decrease. You start taking a little bit of current, the voltage will sharply decrease. So that decrease from one almost to something from that. We always de we can define that region since the losses are dominated by the electrochemical activation. So therefore, we call it activation losses. After that, then we end up with a wide range of current drawn from that particular cell, and the voltage will almost linearly decreasing according to the increase of the current drawn from it. So the more current you draw, the more flow resistance it becomes, the more water becomes uh, being generated. You have to remove the water. All these kind of internal losses. And they give you almost a linear manner. And that linear manner 
and uh, this can be easily represented uh, as an internal resistance. And that internal resistance we can define as an omega, uh, omega losses, omega resistance, uh, because you can really function like an omega resistance, like the victim. Uh, that's the one. So basically, linear proportional with uh, the amount of current in the from the cell. And finally, there is another major, right? And now you start draw the current. The more current you draw, the more reactions that happen to the inside and more water being produced. And the water being produced so much, the system design that is beyond your system design. And then you cannot remove the water efficiently, effectively, you end up with flooding. So the water starts accumulating in the system either block your flow channel or block your GDL. So basically you are losing power very sharply. That is called concentrated forces. That's just too much. But so roughly we turn to divide uh, the fuel cell performance in phase the three region. And uh, that's theoretical work is just that uh, that is the science. But uh, in reality operation of the fuel cell healthily is for this line. Uh, and for this line, the lesson is the voltage along this line multiply the current and the power. Uh, so when you look at a single cell, this one is a kind of a generic, uh, but it's roughly accurate to the reality. So when you draw, let's say, about 0.6, 0.8 amps, almost the opposite at depends on the quality, but if you put a little bit more capital, and uh, so the voltage is high at a high current, or if the catalytic performance, if the MEA performance is decreasing, and at a high current, the voltage will decline quickly. So basically, that decide. So this line, so the, the basically this line, slope of this line decides the quality of the cells. So that is uh, the few things. If we go back uh, a little bit here, and you see that is the performance. But what we talked about is the middle part, the sweet linear part is the omega losses region. It's the reason we need to operate, and it can behave like uh, an electric generator. And it is a function of the temperature. But, and really, give the high temperature activity is better. Internal loss is smaller as it turns to be a little bit higher, and the bot not to high the temperature. So it is a fact. It. And uh, so overall, the temperature distribution is quite an uh, issue. Uh, and if any single point reaction is uh, I mean, higher than the rest, then that uh, the heat release at that point becomes hotter. And uh, if your cooling system cannot uh, effectively remove the heat, the, that particular point may be so high and start out of the control. And start out of control a little bit somewhere right now, it may damage the membrane at that point. When the membrane is damaged at that point, the very least you lost the, the resistance to separate the cathode and the anode. Uh, and the gas start passing through. Uh, and uh, then when it's uh, starting passing through, it's just uh, getting hotter, and uh, the, the, the so-called damage area can do. But that means that the cell is dead. Uh, so that is uh, the thermal management will therefore become quite an issue. And uh, so that is a humidity and water management. As we said, uh, as we said in the middle, in the middle is the membrane, and the membrane is in the water to make it the proton conductive. And the moisture management becomes quite an issue. And what we end up with is how can you produce the water into the system, uh, into the membrane. Uh, as an overall system, we end up with humidifier. Uh, you know, if you look at the fuel cells, a lot of the systems need a humidifier. But, and uh, to minimize the usage of the humidifier, to provide the humidification is a key challenge for the fuel cell system. And uh, so the reason, again, uh, think that the humidifier is the external, the internal is the membrane, and the membrane is the water. So how can you balance that uh, membrane water is uh, a key interest. And uh, the problem down here is 
castle at the outlet of the castle, there is plenty of water being produced. At the intake of the castle, community tend to flow, so you draw the air from the environment and you compress it, the humidity turns below. And we need the humidity at the beginning is at least supply enough I mean, water to communify the mandarin in the middle. But if you cannot do that, the claim is the anode. The anode is hydrogen. Hydrogen doesn't contain water because a uh, pure hydrogen comes out this way. Uh, and hydrogen converts in the proton, proton needs to be dropped into the water. So therefore, on this side, there's no water. The water very much is from on this side. If your membrane is too thick, and when you think about it, the membrane is too thick, the plenty of water, and my oxygen cannot supply enough water at the intake, then you have to purify your hydrogen. So put uh, out the water into hydrogen. Where does the water came from? You know there's plenty of water at the production, at the outlet of the anode, of the cathode. So you have to condense the water and uh, pump it back into the natural uh, hydrogen side, then humidify the hydrogen. So that is called the external humidifier. Right? If that's not good enough, then you build another humidifier on the cathode intake. Then you use uh, produce the water to humidify the system. In that case, you end up the two humidifier. The system going to be extremely bulky. They are very expensive. So the, the, the challenge is if you are interested in fuel cell system, the research, how do you manage the water is one of the key issues. Right? If you manage it properly, and you may realize that if you're interested in, in the uh, latest technology, possibly one way for you can look at the details. In the you know, that is a very reliable vehicle available basically on the market running. And that we call latest design as a full external humidifier. Uh, so the full humidifiers have been minimized. And there are, that's how can they achieve it? They achieve the through the internal recirculation. Uh, so the internal humidification of that thing. They don't need the external humidifier. So that's the technology. And when, if you do in a laboratory, but possibly you need the humidifier for both. So that's a humidification, basically water management. And uh, so that is the performance. And uh, on the humidification, what you can see is to play a major role. Uh, when is 100% relatively humidity, 100% being humidified, that is the flat performance, give you high voltage and high current. That means high power. By the time you reduce the humidification, let's say reduce to the wide region, you can see the performance is a hit at uh, the same voltage the current is very, very low. Of course, that is the power curve. The power is significantly less than the black one. So play with the humidification, carefully manage it. It's critically important condition without flooding the system. If you make uh, too much water in the system, it's flooded. So that is one. The water management becomes quite an issue. That is uh, the water accumulation. Uh, that's the end of it. Uh, I mean, in this case, let's say single turbine serpentine channel, the single channel. You got it in, you got it out. But, um, uh, so if the water accumulated, so sort of on this corner, you can imagine, like the, the gas flowing will be partially blocked by this water, possibly 100% blocked. Once it's blocked, you have to increase uh, the supply pressure to push the water towards uh, the outlet. And so in this case, we can see on the end channel is a flooded with water, and which means there's no chemical reaction from here and so the efficiency will be decreased. So water management is a key issue. But, and uh, so operating pressure, basically we are talking about uh, stoke geometry. But if you try to supply more air, uh, more air than you need, you have to increase the air intake pressure to generate more air flow. Stoke geometry can be as high as 300%. Uh, and uh, so that is the one. So basically, if you increase the operation pressure and uh, you 
encourage the gas diffusion, we encourage the electrochemical reaction based on the power output. So if you decrease the pressure, of course, uh, you discourage the gas diffusion and uh, then the gas becomes the less powerful. So that's the relationship. It's quite straightforward to explain. Well, operating pressure, but well, in generally speaking, is uh, what we end up with uh, uh, here. Uh, and uh, the higher term to give you uh, the better, so the power output. But as a system, if you try to supply higher pressure, especially on the cathode side, the air side, if you have to pro provide high pressure air, you need a bigger pump to compress it. And the pump will take the power from your system and then slow down your system efficiency. Otherwise, the power output density system operating efficiency needs to be balanced off. So, in that sense, the air compressor becomes quite a major uh, component to affect the system efficiency. In reality, it is. If you say, uh, uh, if you just mentioned before the one hour, before now, this hour, I said, the, the fuel cell system fuels are above 50 percent. In that 50 percent, catalysts are above 50 percent. The catalysts are about a quarter. The remaining by quarter, plate, GPL, etc., will contribute a quarter. Uh, a half 50 percent balance of flight. What what is the major cost from that? From that is the air compressor. Air compressor is contributing in the half of that total cost. So that's a quarter. So it's a serious component uh, to really to, 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 to increase uh, the bill of the material. Well, so we talked about this. And uh, durability. We said uh, the durability of the fuel cell, and that is uh, clearly to show what is uh, the catalyst. Uh, the catalyst, uh, I mean, initially you've got uh, the anomer, you've got uh, the catalyst the substrate, on the substrate you've got the uh, nanoparticles catalyst. Well, during the operation, it's turned to sort of moving around a little bit. Once they start moving around, it turns to be, I mean, thin together. Once they glue together, performance is reducing. But the durability, and uh, it is a uh, quite a big challenge at the moment as well. And if you're interested in that, there are a few big uh, fuel cell suppliers in this world so far. And one of, one of them called Malad. Uh, that's in Canada, Vancouver. And one obviously is Toyota, they produce uh, the meat product. And of course, uh, at Lovebird, we have a company that's called Intelligent Energy, and uh, they produce Canada as well. So that's quite a few. You can easily name five out of ten or twenty in the world, around the world. And the durability is all not satisfactory. Uh, and uh, uh, DOE again is saying is a 5,000 uh, uh, will be uh, necessary, maybe for passenger in public, uh, 5,000 hours. Current standard, about half of it, and uh, depends on the duty cycle, how big the gas the, the, the fuel cell. Uh, so that's a, a quite debatable. The test procedure at the moment, there isn't a single standard. So therefore, different manufacturers give you the data. It's not necessarily back to back, however. But generally speaking, we are still we are still below this target. And what we need is quickly exceeding this target, then to make a somehow competitive uh, in the real world application with uh, the internal combustion. Well, and uh, so inside of the fuel cell test, uh, there are a few different technologies. In most cases, the people turn to Yes, and uh, that's been to measure the impedance, and uh, the impedance result uh, will give you a, a result like this. From that, then you can work on what is the internal resistance of the fuel cell, and then you can work on uh, what is uh, the only the uh, operating range, uh, and the same way the company first towards that only the resistance, then finally identify the problem improve it. So that is for the whole cell, this is cathode the anode. And uh, cyclic uh, volumetry and uh, can really give a half cell test if you just test the anode 
with all the moving the castle, all of the, the sand of the castle, so which is uh, the plastic thing for what? Then you can put the animal the materials and that sort of research. So that's normally the research part of it. So finally, it's the stack. Right? As I said, you've got a single cell. Single cell is good, but it's not powerful enough. You can encourage, uh, you can increase the current of the single cell by making it larger. From a five a square centimeter, you can make it a fifty, from fifty to one hundred, one hundred, two hundred, two hundred, two hundred fifty, or even three hundred. Some manufacturer even doing a little bit above three hundred square centimeter. For the high power auto fuel cell stack, such as let's say uh, 100 kilowatts plus, you do need a very large current, and that current decided by the size uh, by the size of it of the single cell. But the voltage is simply came from the number of the cells being put together. That's give you the overall voltage. So we end up with as a machine power generator a a stack, single cell to be stacked together. So basically, let's tell you exactly what the stack looks like. You've got uh, a membrane right in the middle, light gray. You've got a catalyst next to it. You've got uh, the DDLs are next to it. You've got uh, I mean, basically MEA. For the MEA, I need a channel on this side to provide the hydrogen. On this side, hydrogen, hydrogen. Uh, let's give me anode. On the opposite side, I need the oxygen, oxygen. Then it's giving me a voltage. That assume this side is zero, that gives me 0.6 for example, or 0.8 volt. I need, let's say, 1.6. So therefore, I need another cell. So next to it, give me a channel, let's say, hydrogen, hydrogen again, oxygen, and at least two. Then, uh, I mean, that is 0.6 or 0.8, let's say, volts. And the next to it is a zero, basically 0 0.8, plus a cell, another 0 0.8, going up to 1.6. So if you think all these cells are in a serial manner, then you end up with the high voltage overall stack. All that stack, I mean, to pull them together in series, quite straightforward, but in reality, there are quite a few things we need to consider. To produce a stack like this. In this stack, I think that more than 300 cells required to build up this stack. But, and we need a few things. The first thing is to clamp them together. The clamping force and the, the distribution of the clamping force is uh, quite uh, an issue. But the second, cooling. Because each cell has an efficiency. And the inefficient part of that efficiency will become the waste heat. And that waste heat is removed, need to be removed efficiently. So we need talking about cooling. Especially when you think about the middle cells, and you can accumulate quite a lot of thermal energy and need a cooler to do it. The next thing, quite a big challenge, is the steady. So we need to seal basically uh, the, the channel we're from the environment. And uh, you still the hydrogen inside of this salt of thinking. Right? And uh, hydrogen is uh, the smallest possible gas. And uh, trying to seal it is um, a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. And uh, then gas transport. So we need all these uh, channels to give us uh, the maximum gas transportation, the minimal flow restriction, and as well as to remove the heat and also give us conductivity of uh, the electrons. So that's end up with a big challenge of the gas transport and the cell to cell by weight. So you make every single cell. The MEA is not absolutely useful. So a cell to cell, a cell to cell a little bit different. And we need to do that and we need to monitor. We need to monitor this multi-cell stack and each cell's uh, state of the house to ensure the stack gives you the performance all important the durability. Well, so that it is roughly stack. If we open up the stack, so overall we have a current collector. So that to give us the overall voltage and overall current. In other words, it is the power. And right inside, there's a lot of multi cells. 
for example, we got this one cell that is a bipolar plate inside the membrane, and also the, on the edge of the membrane, the sealant, and then next to it, another bipolar plate, you stack them together. So for each cell in the automotive application, the area is around 200 to 400. And the 300 uh, around is more popular, and we do need that many, many cells together. But all the way up to 400, 500 cells, you make uh, the entire stack. But, and the number of the cells, of course, is down to the power of the unit. And for automotive, again, it's trying to be a 100 kilowatts per of the unit. The beauty of the fuel cell principle. Doesn't imagine you operate the system small or large, and uh, the electrochemical reaction, the catalyst, etc., exactly the same. So that's giving you the best thing about the fuel cell. It's fairly flexible. Uh, so there are a few challenges. A big challenge down here is cooling. Since the fuel cell in reality operating is around 50% energy efficiency, you end up with roughly 50% energy. Converted waste, and you have to take the waste away from the system. Right. So that end up with but problem down here. I think we talked about yesterday. It's the dirt and heat. If you try to remove the heat, it's the, the Q equal to the mass flow rate of your cooling multiplied by the temperature equal to the dirt and heat. If the dirt and heat is bigger, your cooling flow rate is smaller. If you the third T is the small, the cooling flow rate has to be big. Unfortunately, that is exactly the situation of the pump fuel cell. The third T is very small. Well, and for combustion, the third T is a little bit bigger. So which means for the internal combustion engine, we move the excessive heat through coolant is much easier to manage than the hydrogen cells. Well, so that is our coolant. So we need to develop some clever, I mean, sophisticated cooling methodology. There are two main cooling strategies that is on the market. Right? And uh, so basically it is air cooling, cathode air cooling. You can call it an air cool fuel cell. As somebody called it an open cathode fuel cell. They all mean exactly the same thing, which means on the cathode, we need to supply oxygen, but the oxygen supplied from the air, what you can do is you can make the cathode fully open to the environment and blow the air, pass through the cathode. Then the air will do two jobs. One job will provide oxygen for the reaction. At the same time, the excessive amount of the air will take the heat generated by the system and blow it away. So doing a cool job. So that's an I cold one. Another one you can call it a closed or sealed cathode system, which means that you supply the air inside uh, uh, into the cathode, but the cathode is not fully open to the environment. Uh, and in that case, you have to remove the excessive heat through other means, through internal means. And that internal means are often enough waste. You have to design the cooling jacket inside the fuel cell. Uh, and just for that one, we call it the liquid coat. Uh, so you end up with roughly this two branches. And uh, so the picture down here is uh, I borrowed, and this one as well. So I borrowed from uh, basically from the manufacturers. What well, you can see, of course, it's not large enough to see it. What you can see down here is. Uh, there's a lot of uh, tiny, I mean, formalist holes. The hole is uh, almost uh, one by one, or uh, one meter by one meter, sometimes just like the smaller uh, of the channel section area, so one millimeter by one millimeter. And that is uh, the flow channel. That flow channel is an open cathode, provide oxygen to the action as well as uh, pass through the air, remove the heat. And uh, liquid cooling. The liquid cooling is becomes a little bit more challengeable, and that is very much down to the channel design. But in this case, what we end up with is so one side you provide the gas, on this side you provide the contact, 
on behind of the compact part, you can design that one as a big tunnel. So let the water pass through. So if you end up with a serpentine gas tunnel, and behind the serpentine tunnel, you can design that the opposite serpentine as the water tunnel. Apply the water and take it away. Another way to do that is uh, this kind of graphite bipolar plate. You end up with the one bipolar plate, you pass through basically the gas channel, or for this side, you pass through the, with the water channel. Then you do another one, gas channel, water channel, you glue them together. Then you end up with the gas channel for anode, gas channel for cathode, right in the middle is the liquid channel for cooling water. So you can always do that and then. So made the bipolar plate design uh, for liquid cooling much, much more complicated. But the beauty of that for liquid cooling is kind of a large amount of money away from it. The problem of that one is the complexity. Uh, the beauty of the eye cold one, you can make the cooling channel much, much easier. Uh, the problem of it is volume. But you have to make the cathode much, much bigger than the liquid cooling one. So therefore the system so we end up more often for low power output unit, you can afford to use the high code. For high power unit, you have to go for example, automotive, you can't afford to use the high code. Well, so stacking them together, challenge. So what we said is, you say that is the gas channel for hydrogen, gas channel for air, and then opposite side the gas channel for hydrogen, and the two bipolar plates, I mean, fill them, I mean, weld them together, you end up with the middle part. The middle part is you can supply the coolant. But, so that is the one. Then, I mean, you have to really laser to weld the metal. If you use metal, what we said, that the sandwich glue them together is graphite. If you use a metal plate, you can also do it. Uh, but, yeah, so that you have to weld them together. That's so all the welding point. Uh, and the next thing is a ceiling. Right, so we got the gas channel here, and on top surface of this gas channel, it should be the GDL. On that GDL, the gas uh, under the man, uh, MEA, and uh, then we need to seal it off. So you have to design the, the ceiling. So the ceiling itself, I mean, the shape is not too complicated. The complicity is from the material. And in that environment, inside environment, you play with the proton and the water. As I said, that is the acid. So it's a pretty close environment. And you have to really get the good enough saline materials and give you the saline job, also anti corrosion. So that is a really another sort of problem. And uh, so finally, we got to the self voltage. And if you got, let's say, many cells together, and you need to really monitor the cell voltage and uh, class them together and give you stack voltage. So we need to monitor that one and somehow to man and make sure they can distribute, uh, they can generate a equal amount of the voltage to give you a stable stack design. And the gas transportation actually we already talked about that a lot when we're talking about the polar place. And so basically you've got the in, you've got the out, you can get the multiple single channel or the serpentine channel, or depends on your design, you can design a three dimensional type of channels. And so that's again different manufacturer has a slightly different idea. Uh, principle is perhaps the same. So well, that's what we need to understand. Is to deliver the gas in the right? uh, and uh, so that uh, uh, to, to do the two functions, and on the opposite side, you deliver a uh, different gas. So that is really the bipolar place unit. And uh, clamping, as, uh, as we said, we have the multi cells together. When you stack them together, and you lack the internal connection, right in the center of the fuel cell, the, connect, the mechanical compressing force should be not much different from the mechanical clamping force on the edge. So you need clamping them as as possible. 
could distribute to the force in the middle so of a massive like, So then you can avoid the, the high reaction area and the poor reaction area. They can every single area reaction rate for less than six. So that's the ideal situation. And uh, mechanically to do it, it's quite a challenge. The challenge is also the sailing. The sailing. Uh, you can only sail the system around the edge to reduce the complexity. Therefore, your clamping unit has to be outside of the sailing unit. So uh, in that way, you can sail, you can generate a mechanical climbing force around the cell or the not in the cell. And you are expecting the inner cell to be calling to the surrounding edge. That's both a certain challenge. Bearing in mind also, this whole system doesn't give you the space. So the bipolar plate that is not a metal, a thicker metal plate. That gives you the weight, weight panel to make it as thin as possible. Or you go for uh, even thin uh, graphite, doesn't give you any space. So how can you make sure that compression gives you a, a proper a clamping force distribution? That's another challenge. So there are different ways. So you can use uh, the sort of a screw and not on the screw to pull them together, or you can use uh, the clamping metal stick to hold them together. So there's so many different designs. And the future development. So. Uh, basically, there are a few key parameters we need to put in place to make the fuel cell as good as uh, a power plant for automobile applications. Um, energy efficiency generally is significantly higher than internal combustion engine. Right? So there's uh, no need to talk about it. And the fuel cell target, of course, is always higher. And power density, that's a key, pretty important thing. So far, is around that's the power density of the system, not the stack. The stack can be very high in the modern design. But right? the system at this moment is not very good currently. It's around 600, 650. And what we need is got to be on the level close enough to a kilowatt, a liter. Because that's when you think about internal combustion engine system, not the cylinder, but right? the entire engine. It's almost a kilogram per meter. So that's what you end up with. If you want the fuel cell system to be compatible with as an engine, so we need nearly a liter per, uh, a kilo per liter, a kilowatt per liter. And the power, specific power, is almost the same. So a kilogram per, I mean, uh, a kilowatt per kilogram or even higher. I say engine at the moment, and the gas is the diesel, that scale you are about of one to two kilowatts per kilogram. So therefore the fuel cells still have a, a, a gap, a, a long journey to go. And the cost, at the moment, the fuel cell cost is uh, uh, very high. The high is uh, a major reason behind it is not because of the material, a major reason behind it is the cost. Durability. So, how many hours, how many cycles the system can do is constantly a challenge. So, basically, we are aiming for 8,000, 10,000 hours. And that's made as uh, one uh, fuel cell system, not really for this internal combustion engine, but it's suitable for automotive application. So, when we say, when we say suitable, that's the two years. But 
And uh, so that's the whole thing of all the things that we have to do with that great and golden hours. And the uh, unassisted temperature so far is all much a major uh, player, especially when it comes to the world. It's kind of starting to survive, and I think very soon they will work. They will be able to cool down and dirty. So that is it. So, put into a conclusion, what we can say is uh, the public view cell is quite interesting. It is a good technology and a new single type of The beauty of that is that the water is a sure. It's not very good for the house. It's a sign and so that is clear. So very much, if you imagine every single one from your few cells, they're just broken. That's starting to be an arm. So that is a very nice thing. It doesn't so you say forget about all the other problems. But and the converting into electricity, the key components in that is that really need to understand the understand, try to understand the is which the lack of reaction plus the summer management and the class of the school and uh, management and uh, etc. So that's the idea. But then we need to back them together through the bipolar plate and we then put the bipolar plate there. So that's it. So bipolar plate is another key component, the multifunction to hold the fuel cell together. And finally, to get the fuel cell to enough power in the stack. And the stack is multi cell stack together. Among the stack, there may be a lot of key questions. First key question, solar. Next key question, water. Next key question is to get the air, the, fuel, the air, the hydrogen. So we've got a linear and a kind of space. You end up with a lot of very technical, scientific, or academic intelligence like this. So we need a lot of analysis. Feels that essentially itself on the enemy particular. It's a kind of a two dimensional point. In reality, it's not necessary to be a two dimensional because of the proton conductivity. And the electron conductive bucket as well. What's the future? The future is that you put basically.